What's happening, everybody? I don't think I had any audio on that intro. That's all right. I don't have my speakers on, so I couldn't hear anything. So let me know. I think it was silent. <laughs> I think it was silent. How's everybody going today? We are going to get started here in just a few minutes. Uh, we're going to uh, give some more people a chance to come in, and uh, we'll get started. I hope everything is going well for y'all this uh, evening. Thank you for joining me once again this week. Tonight, we're going to talk about anything and everything, open Q&A, so you guys and girls can start typing in your questions and stuff. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'm going to be talking to you about um, when you're creating your carvings, your signs and all, ways to kind of dress them up if you will, uh, ways to kind of give them a little bit of character and stuff uh, and um, things that we could do and how we would do them or how I would approach, uh, you know, a simple sign. You guys saw the thumbnail, so you can kind of get an idea of what we're doing and stuff. Uh, if um, you didn't see the thumbnail, I'll show you the project that we're going to be working on. Boom, 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 boom. Let me see. Can I show you the project that we're working on? Yeah. So let's. Uh, so that's the project we're going to kind of work on and we're going to lay out and stuff. Uh, I got some texture going on in the background. I uh, got some raised images and we got some nice little decorative touches that we're going to uh, create. Utilizing uh some vector uh ornamental vectors as well as kind of uh you know creating our own and stuff uh doing some editing and all so that'll be some of the, that'll be the project that we're going to be working on while we're going through and doing a q a and stuff so i hope you guys and girls enjoy it i believe it is uh getting close to starting time uh so we will get ready to jump right in to it here in a minute. Let's get our job set up, opened up over here. All right, well, welcome Mark, Jennifer, Ronnie, Kevin, Mike, and Pekirk. Uh, give me your name and uh, I'll make it, it'll sound better than M. Pekirk, uh, because I believe it's like probably a mic or a, something. Mike Smith, Ken Singleton, man, Ken, welcome. Uh, I'm surprised you were able to get away with that long carving you got going on. <laughs> uh, and uh, Roger, David, everybody that's joined us, thank you uh, for popping in and stuff. And uh, yeah. Oh, Ken, when you uh, sent me that email and told me uh, how long that carving was going to be, I knew it was going to be a long one, but that's a long one for sure. What was it like a 40 hour run? Time? <laughs> I did a sign once uh, that uh, the entire pro and that wasn't a sign. I'm sorry. It was a uh, cabinet project. And with the doors and the sides and all the carvings and everything, it was a total of 140 hour run time. It's crazy. It was crazy. And I was, I, I had a short deadline too, boy. I, I didn't know if I was going to make it or not. It was a short deadline, but I made it. Uh, nothing, nothing went wrong. Hey, Chris, welcome. Thanks for joining us. All right. So, uh, as I said, we're going to have kind of an open Q&A platform so you guys and girls can ask questions. I'll answer them as we go. But at the same time, I'm going to be talking to you. Uh, we're going to lay out a sign, a simple sign. We're going to add some characters, some character to it. And uh, we're going to use some uh, vectors. Uh, ornamental vectors that I have uh, that um, I have from a vintage uh, collection from my Adobe suite and stuff. And uh, these, you know, the vectors, you can uh, you can find them online. You There's all kinds of nice little uh, places uh, to get different uh, vectors and stuff online. Uh, I just pulled uh, four or five from my Adobe Illustrator vintage collection of uh, decorative ornamental vectors to lay out this sign with. And um, we're going to go from there. All right. Hey, welcome, Dave. 
It's over. 40 hours for a 3D finish cut. It's over. So it, it got done. Uh, you'll definitely have to, I'm hoping, my fingers crossed, uh, that it came out good. But if there's any changes or anything you need to make in it, uh, anything we need to address, definitely let me know, Ken. Um, but uh, I'm hoping that it came out well, you know, since I made it for you. <laughs> I'm hoping that I did all right. Um, all right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump right into our Vetrix software. Let's get things kind of rolling here. Uh, for this job, it is just going to be a simple single-sided job. Uh, for my job size, basically, uh, I've got a 22-inch 1 by 12, uh, if you will. So it's 11 and a quarter inches uh, in the y-axis and the width and the height, and it's three quarter inches thick. Um, you know me, and you know I usually touch off on the machine bed, and I usually work from the bottom left corner. I'm going to change it up today, and uh, I'm going to uh, work from the material surface and start from the center. And it's just the only reason I'm changing it up is just to show that, you know, you don't always have to work from a certain area and stuff. Uh, you can have the freedom to work from where you want. So I got this set up and uh, it gives me that nice little crosshair in the center and stuff to uh, uh, work with and everything. Okay. So let's get into this. Um, I've got, uh, basically, I'm just using kind of a simple appearance of a Canadian maple. So in the uh, 3D view, we got a nice little clear, clean piece of material to uh, preview our cuts and stuff in. Let's take a look at what we've got for our sign here, what vectors I'm going to be using. Uh, let's get up close and personal with these. Let's get them on the whiteboard so they're a little bit easier to uh, view. And uh, some of these items, they're going to be sized up and everything. They're real small. But basically, we have this nice little ornamental design here. We got this little design. I thought this looked like a windmill like uh, because I'm making a, a country sign, kind of a farm sign, if you will. And I thought that little guy looked like a windmill. Uh, so we're going to utilize that. I uh, got a nice little um, end cap for something here, uh, this little arrow with these swirls, if you will. Got another nice little uh, spiral swirl here uh, with uh, some uh, decorative designs coming out of it. I've got this little floral design, and then I've got these two, if you will, I call them bookends, <laughs> but I've got these two bookends uh, and everything. And we're going to utilize, uh, and also I got a chicken with some eggs. I'm making a farm sign, farm fresh eggs. Uh, and so I got this chicken with some eggs. So I'm going to utilize these elements here to help me uh, give my sign a little bit of character. So let's get uh, up close and personal on our sign board here. And the first thing I'm going to start out with is some text. So uh what uh hey david hey laura uh all right what i want to do is i want to open up my uh text box now one of the cool things uh i've showed this to you guys uh many times uh but on the intranet if you will uh a very cool site that helps you choose fonts uh the fonts that are in your computer is word mark dot it and you want to take advantage of the adobe flash or the flash uh that's in here so um right down here at the bottom where it says click to enable the adobe flash player that way it'll show you all the fonts on your computer but you can type in a word or a phrase whatever it may be and uh, it will load and show you all the fonts that are installed on your computer. Um, and it's a great way to help you kind of when you're laying out artwork and stuff. It's a nice way to get a bit of a visual of what the font uh, will look like in things. And uh, for me, I really uh, like that. Now. For me, the 
two fonts that I'm going to be using are, let's see here. Let's get down to it. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Bear with me. Bear with me. Where'd my font go? where my font go? There's impact. Uh, oh, it's not showing me all my fonts. Why isn't it showing me all my fonts? Do I not have, I've got the Adobe Flash enabled, but bummer, dude. Well, then we'll just pop back over to the veteran. Anyway, uh, it should show you all your fonts if you got the Adobe Flash enabled. Uh, what's that? Oh, that's my Grammarly, so don't misspell anything. Uh, let's minimize this a little bit. Can't see all your fonts. Uh, these are your default system fonts. Install our Chrome extension to see the rest of your fonts. Oh, I don't have my Chrome extension on this browser. Uh, but anyway, the fonts aren't there. So uh, basically, I'm going to be using what's called a saddlebag font. Uh, got that off of dafont.com. Uh, really nice uh, font there. And I'm going to be using Cooper Black. Uh, so these are the two fonts. And the one thing I love about the new Vetric uh, version 10 is the recent fonts that you use, that you've used, they now appear at the top. When you open up your text box, your most recent fonts that you used are at the top. You know, all the fonts are in alphabetic order, but it throws those in the top. And uh, it's really nice uh, that uh, I can go to them quickly, uh, especially if I... Don't remember what the name of the font was when I was using it and stuff. Uh, let's start with our Cooper Black, and uh, we're gonna go with a. Uh, for right now, we're gonna go with a one and a half inch tall uh, text, and we're simply going to, in all capital letters, we're going to say that these eggs are farm fresh. Okay. Now. Uh, within uh, the font here, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and get it centered on my board uh, using my alignment tool centered in my material. I'm going to be moving it up here in a moment, but that just kind of gets me uh, to where I can start my layout. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to give this a little bit of a curve. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, let's stop for a moment here. Uh, Mike says the background color, not the work area, but the 3d background color on your computer appears to be white. Mine is blue. How do I change it in the 3d view? So what Mike is referring to is my white background here, uh, in the software and Mike, uh, and everybody else, uh, that's under the edit options. And in your background here under the 3D view settings, you have the actual choice of using a gradient, a solid color, or an image. And the cool thing about the image is if I were, if I had a customer that was hanging this image or hanging this uh, sign up on their wall and they really couldn't kind of visualize it, they're not very visual folks and they couldn't visualize what it's like. So they're having a hard time deciding what they want and things. I can literally either have them to take a picture of the wall where it's going to hang, or I can take a picture of the wall and go to their place and take a picture of it. And I can actually load that background as the image. I can create the sign and I can literally move it around and hang it up on the wall, change the perspective of it and everything. So they can kind of get a visual of what it would look like and all. It's really cool. But uh, we can change our background color or our gradient color. In this case, I have just solid white here uh, and everything. Uh, but it's right here, these top three sections in the options area. Okay. So, uh, Mike, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, on the uh, text here, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give it a little bit of a curve. And so I'm actually going to use the edit text spacing and curve tool. And when I'm in that tool, 
my mouse has this little nice T next to it. Uh, so if you're ever in that tool and everything, you ever see the little T in your mouse and you're trying to select something else other than text, it's not going to happen. You're going to be like, man, why won't it select the frame? Why won't it select this? Why won't it select that? Because you are in that text curve spacing tool and everything. You would go back to your selection mode to get out of that tool. You want to see that nice clean mouse. But let's go back into that tool because I'm going to take this green node here and I'm just going to give myself a small little arc. Nothing extravagant or, you know, grand or anything like that. Just a nice little arc here. And uh, with that, I can um, work off that and, you know, size it up or move it around or whatever I need to do. And for right now, that's going to be a good size for me. Now, I'll be manipulating that a little later here uh, and stuff, but um, that's going to work. Now, uh, on this, I do I do go back every once in a while and I make sure that things are centered and all that stuff uh, and nothing has changed. So uh, you saw it shift over just that little bit uh, and everything. I always do that just to make sure that, um, you know, everything's nice and centered. And then uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to draw a rectangle. Let's get a rectangle going on here. Pretty, pretty decent size. Uh, I don't want it real long. Uh, maybe something about like that with square corners. Let's get square corners on there. There we go. And uh, once again, I'm going to use my alignment tool and align that to the center there. All right. So as we go, um, howdy, everyone. Hey, Tim. Good. How are you doing, bud? Uh, what I'd like to do is I want to create an offset. I basically want to create another box within this box. So I'm going to go to my offset and layout tools and I'm going to go inward. Oh, an eighth of an inch is good. Uh, I want create sharp corners and uh, let's go offset inward. Yeah, that's good. Wonderful. All right. Now what I'd like to do is get my text in here. Now I have two ways of creating text, uh, draw text or draw text within a vector box. Now, draw text within a vector box, if I happen to have a box selected, will basically give me the dimensions of that box, and it will restrict the text to that box. And in the case of this, I want to um, choose my font. I'm going to come all the way down to the S's because I haven't used this tool, so they're not at the top of the font, or the top of the box, should I say. But I'm going to use the saddlebag font right here. And um, I'm going to type out the word eggs. Okay. Now it will restrict that text uh, and size it to that box. Now what I do want is I want it centered in that box and I want normal margins around it. Okay. Uh, I could have wide or normal margins or no margins. And I can even stretch the text characters uh, vertically as well as horizontally, uh, you know, to really fill in that box if I wanted to. And that's what that text, draw text within a vector box does. It we, we give it a boundary. Even if we don't have a box drawn on the screen, we could type in the dimensions and it'll create a virtual box, you know. So in this case, I don't want any stretching of the characters and I want normal margins on my text here. I want normal margins. And I want no stretching of the characters. And I just want it nice and centered in there. Awesome blossom. Okay. Now, on my box, uh, basically, what I'd like to do is, oops, uh, on my box here. Now, I'm drawing my mouse from right to left. So, whatever my little window, my little uh, zoom window or drawing window or whatever you want to call it window, uh, whatever lines it touches, it will select if I go from right to left. If I go from left to right, it has to be 100% in that selection window. There we go. Selection window. That's what it's called. Um, what I'd like to do with this is I'd like to double click, put it in transform mode. 
I'm going to hold my shift key down to keep it centered. And I'm just going to bring this in ever so slightly about like that. All right. I'm happy with that. We're going to go with that. Uh, and then I'm going to take that box and bring it down. I'm just using the arrow keys on my keyboard to move it down. Awesome. All right. How do you adjust the letter uh, text spacing? So uh, I got a question. How do you adjust the letter text spacing? So let's say that on my text here, especially like the A and the R, let's say I wanted to put a little bit more space in between these two and maybe take a little out of these two. Um, that is also the edit text spacing and curve tool. And when I select my text, when I put my mouse between two letters or two lines, if I had multiple lines, uh, I'll get this VNA with these two black arrows pointing inward. And so that means if I left click, I'm reducing the spacing between those letters. Now, if I hold my shift key, you'll see those arrows change direction. And so if I hold my shift key when I left click, then I'm pushing those letters apart. Okay. So we'll come in here and adjust. Uh, let's back that one back up. We'll adjust it ever so slightly like that. Okay. So uh, Camaro, that's how you do that, bud. Uh, if I had multiple lines, when I put my mouse between two lines, then I could increase or decrease the spacing between those lines with the same tool on that edit text spacing and curve tool. All right. So now I'm going to break out and I'm going to come over to uh, some of my vectors that I have here. My first one I'm going to grab is my little chicken here with the eggs. And I'm going to go ahead and drag that onto the board here. And I'm going to give it just a little bit more size. I'm going to grab the corner to keep the aspect ratio. Just make it a little bit bigger. Not too much. <clears throat> and I would like the same image on the other side of my project. So I'm going to open up my mirror tool. I'm going to select my object first. Open up my mirror tool. And I'm going to create a mirrored copy. Flipping about job center. And I'm going to flip it horizontally to get that over there. And everything. All right. All right. Now I do want to, I'm going to actually undo that because I do want to kind of bring this in a little bit because I'm going to end up drawing a border uh, around uh, my object there. And so I want to, I'm going to have a half inch border around here. So I don't want to be too close to uh, everything, but that's good. Now I'm going to re mirror that just simply flip it horizontally. All right. And guys and girls, but remember now, just as you're watching me and stuff, this is an open Q&A also. So you can go ahead and type your questions and I will answer them as we go. All right. So now I've got kind of the roughing of what I want. Now I'm going to start adding some uh, character to this. Before I start, I said that I wanted a border. So I'm going to open up my rectangle tool and I'm just going to snap my mouse right to the corner here. And I'm going to drag, holding down that left mouse button, I'm going to drag my box and snap to this other corner on the board. And let's kind of zoom in so you all can see that clearly. Let's uh, scroll this down. Not that big. All right. Now, with that, I'm going to offset that rectangle border, deleting the original. I don't want the original left on here. Uh, I'm going to offset inward and I'm going to go a uh, half an inch and I want square corners. I want to select the new vector that gets drawn and I want to delete this original rectangle uh, to create that border there. All right. All right. Now with that vector still selected, I'm going to actually pop back into the rectangle tool and I'd like to give it an internal radius uh, I'd like to give it an internal radius of uh, one inch and uh, kind of get those curves in there and everything. Nice little one inch radius and stuff. Now, one of the cool things, you know, uh, doing this, that was the easy way, right? Uh, just come back in here, create that one inch radius and you'd be done with it. But I'm going to undo this. And I just want to, you know, kind of uh, show you some things you can use. You can use 
your shapes and everything to create other shapes and stuff. Uh, so if I wanted to, um, oops, hold on, one inch radius, one inch radius, um, you can use your shapes, and I'm just left clicking on these four corners here. And I could simply, you know, grab my trim tool, my scissor tool, and come over here and trim away these shapes to create the same exact shape that I just created with the rectangle tool. So you can use shapes to create shapes. Uh, you can create all kinds of decorative borders and really neat things that way by doing that. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to share that with you. So I like coming in and sometimes making custom borders and things, you know, if I wanted this, uh, to have that radius, but then come in and maybe have an arch up here, you know, I could, uh, draw that in, uh, if you will, and, uh, you know, trim everything together to create that new border, all kinds of things. So, um, all right. And so Ronnie, Ronnie says, where did you go to get the chickens? To the farm, Ronnie. I went to the farm, got them chickens. Uh, those chickens, uh, basically, um, I went on Google and I researched uh, chicken vector. <laughs> chicken vector. And um, that gave me uh, this image here from stock vectors. Uh and uh, it was a nice little uh, image there. And so, oops, whoa, get dizzy that way. Uh, so that's the vector that I'm using. That's the vector that I'm using. So it was just a simple trace of that vector and all to get that chicken. I liked this chicken. It was a very nice, clean image and uh, it had the three eggs. And that, that was what I wanted was those eggs because I'm farm fresh eggs is what I'm trying to promote here. Um, all right. So we've got our chickens in, we've got our border in. Now we can start laying out some decorative elements. Uh, how we start, how we approach this. Um, it doesn't matter what order we go in and everything. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start with my eggs here and I'm going to sneak over here. And I like this design right here, this design here. I'm going to grab that and I'm going to drag it over and snap it to the left side of my rectangle here for a minute. And let's kind of get up close and personal on this. Uh, now I need to size it up and I want to basically size it up. And I'm going to hold down my shift key and select this rectangle with that already selected first with my rectangle. I can now come into my alignment tool and I can align up and down to get it centered on there. And I can also even, you know, align to the outside edge, right? To get it right where I want it. Okay. And that's where I want it. All right. Now I want a copy of this on the other side. So I'm simply going to come in to my mirror tool. And I'm going to create a copy, flipping it about the job center and flip it horizontally. Okay. As long as I'm all centered up and everything, everything is hunky dory. All right. All right. Okay. So now before I move on to anything else, I'm going to work on this as I need to and um, uh, finish this up, kind of finish up one of them instead of jumping all around. And, uh, we're going to um, be right back out of whiskey. <laughs> All right, Mark. Jeez. You've got to get drunk to listen to me, my irritating voice. All right. So I'm going to actually finish this up. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my rectangle here. And I'm going to go into node editing. So let's close our mirror tool. And I can either go to node editing by clicking my node editing tool under edit objects over here. Or when I have an object selected, I can just hit the letter N for node editing. I can hit the letter N on my keyboard. So this line between these two nodes of this rectangle, it's a span. And so I want to put my mouse right on that line, right click and delete that span. Okay. 
And then on this inner rectangle, same thing. I'm going to right click and delete that span. Uh, not insert point, delete span. There we go. All right, so now basically I've just opened up this vector on this side. Now, while I'm in node editing mode, I might as well come over here and do the same thing. I'm going to right click and delete that span. Click on this one, right click and delete that span. Now, when I right click uh, to get the menu, uh, that's fine. I could just simply hover my mouse right over the line and hit the letter D on my keyboard because in node editing mode, uh, D is delete span, right? All right. Um, so now I have this open vector and everything, and I want to join it to this vector. So I've got to use my extend tool. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to use my extend tool and I'm going to extend these lines to this line, this, this, this contour here. So basically if I use, if I hover my mouse over these lines, you'll see it shoots this dotted line out, this pink line where it's going to extend to. And so basically I'm going to click here first and then I'm going to click on my line and notice when I'm clicking on it, it's not doing anything. It's not finishing it off. We're going to get up close and personal. Uh, and the reason, and we click on it and you know, and like, why isn't it doing that? Well, the reason why it will not expand to this object is because this object is grouped. So make sure that if you have a grouped object, ungroup it with the ungroup button here or the letter U on your keyboard, either one, ungroup your objects. So, oops. Whoa, whoa. What was that? Sorry about that. Did I throw you off there? Um, let's uh, let's get back in here. Let me mirror that back. I hit the wrong button. Get back over there. Um, I hit the wrong button and uh, everything went crazy. All right. Stop doing that. Now, that ungroup, what I, what's happening is, is even though my layer is active, when I'm ungrouping this, it's actually opening up these other two layers that I have here um, because of the simple fact that these objects right here are on this import three layer. They're not on my class project layer, even though it looks like they're on the page, right? They're still separated by layers and everything. And so what I want to do is I want to right click on these and make sure that they are moved to that class project layer here as well. Move to that class project layer. And when I come in uh, and everything, when I go to ungroup these objects, I want to make sure that they ungroup onto the layer that I'm on so it doesn't pop up those other layers and stuff. And when I was clicking just the ungroup over here, it was throwing everything back onto that original layer. Just like you see everything pop up here and we don't want that. Uh, so um, if that happens to you, simply, you know, come into your object and right click on it and choose ungroup objects, ungroup onto groups layer. OK, it's saying basically onto the groups layer, the group, this group, the layer that it's currently on ungroup it to that layer and it's instead of throwing it to the original layer that we copied it from or that we moved it from and stuff. Okay. And everything. All right. Now, um, <laughs> Oh wow. Mark's hooked up to the 75 inch TV tonight, man. I am larger than life. Evidently. I bet you. Um, all right, so now we have our objects ungrouped. Okay, all these individual vectors are ungrouped. Now we can come in and use our extend tool. And this time when we click on our line and click on our line, it's going to extend uh, like it's supposed to. Okay. And what we need to do is uh, I'm going to be going in and out of the extend tool between the extend and the trim tool because I don't like going uh, and moving until one area is done. 
So I'm going to use my trim tool and I'm simply going to trim away here. And if we look closely, there's a little bitty overlap. Let's get rid of that one and that one. And the reason why it overlapped is because of the some fact that this is a curve and not a straight line. Okay. And so we've connected that box, those two boxes, basically, essentially to that vector. We're going to do the same thing down here. Rinse and repeat. Click, 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 click. We're going to close that, go into our trim tool, click here and zoom in nice and tight. Get rid of that little overhang there and that overhang there. All right. Now, when you are trimming, make sure that you have the box to rejoin sections automatically when the form is closed, because that will close those vectors up. If I didn't have that checked when I was trimming here, I would still have open vectors. They wouldn't be joined together. So make sure you have that option selected. And once again, rinse and repeat. We're just going to get through this and this. Come in and trim these away. Okay. And last but not least. Now I could have went through and extended all my vectors and then went through and, uh, you know, uh, did all the trimming at one time and stuff. Oops. Did all the trimming and stuff at one time, but um, I I do it this way. Even my old job when I was an electrician, uh, you know, I would take my wires and I would trim my wires, wrap them around the outlets and everything, and then I'd put my trim trimmers away, grab my screwdriver, tighten up that, come back, grab my uh, wire strippers uh, do the other side of the outlet, put them away my screwdriver, tighten them up when I should have just wrapped all four wires around that outlet and then screwed them all down all at one time. So I'm not back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I always do that. And it's actually, you know, in it, I, it actually reflects in my designing too. I go, I stay in one area <laughs> when work my way around. All right. So now what we've done essentially is we've connected this outer box to this outer profile here and this inner box to this inner profile here. So we're going to get a nice looking uh, design when uh, things are uh, happening for us, you know, when we're carving and stuff and, and everything. And uh, stand by a moment. Let me plug in my mouse because the battery just died on me. Wonderful. All right. And so now that object is done. All right. So let's come back over here and let's turn on our items that we have over here. And what are we going to work on next? Let's work on the bottom here. It's a pretty cool uh, design here. I'm going to use these two bookends. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. I'm going to use these two objects here and uh, I'm going to bring them over to uh, here. And before I size them and, and all of that stuff, I'm going to prepare them by simply, I want to rotate these 180 degrees. So I'm going to use the number nine or the number zero key on my keyboard. And I'm simply going to uh, keep clicking the nine and just uh, when we rotate, it rotates in 45 degree increments. Nine is counterclockwise and zero is clockwise when we're rotating. Okay. I could very simply open up my rotate tool rotate off its center and type in 180 degrees, or I could use my keyboard shortcuts, either one. Now on these two objects here, these two objects, what I'd like to do is I'm going to grab this object right here on this corner and I'm gonna, see how it's grouped? Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Gotta ungroup them, right? They're, they're together, they're grouped together as one. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna right click on this and First of all, I'm going to make sure that it's on. See, it's on this layer here. I'm going to move it to the class project layer. And then I'm going to ungroup onto the group layer. So it ungroups onto here. Okay. And so what I would like to do is I'm going to grab this guy and I'm going to drag it over to my center line here. And then I'm going to grab this guy and drag him over to my center line. And what I would like to do is just ever so slightly overlap these lines. And so I'm going to hold down my control key and use my left arrow key and bump that micro bump it. 
That's what the control key does is a micro movement. And I'm going to grab this one, hold down my control key and bump it over. So I have this overlap and that way I can take my scissors and I can click twice to trim that into one piece. Okay. And so now that I have that piece, I can go ahead and size it up. So we'll just go ahead and grab it here and I'm going to hold down my shift key to keep it kind of centered and I'm going to size it up. And then I'm going to use my arrow keys and kind of get it into position. So I think right there looks pretty, pretty, pretty good right there. I'm happy with that. Spacing wise and everything, I'm good. I'll probably bump it down a little bit more. Let's go one more bump. There we go. All right. So that's going to be my bottom piece. All right. All right. Now, these are fine lines. You know, these are very fine lines. I'm not going to get a whole lot of depth of carving and stuff out of them. Uh, so I'm going to have to give myself a start depth when I'm cutting and things so I can get a little bit of definition in these if I was V carving them in or use a finer angle V bit. Either one. And the um, uh, either one that we want to do now. Uh, I could very well, if I wanted to offset this and kind of make the lines a little wider, I could come in here and try to offset it by a few thousandths of an inch. But even if I went 0.005, five thousandths of an inch, create sharp corners where there's sharp corners, delete the original, uh, select the new. If I offset that, um, you know, that's not much of a change. Let's go into, let's try... Ten thousandths of an inch and offset that. What I've done, thinking that I'm going to make my lines wider, I've actually made them narrower, right? And so, you know, I'm just going to stick where it's at. You know? We'll just go there. Uh, I'll get some fine lines, but what I'll do is I'll add some start depth to my toolpath, my V card toolpath. All right, so let's get this kind of uh, front and center here. And let's turn off that selection. And so things are starting to kind of get a little bit a little bit fancy, a little bit fancy uh, and, and everything. Now, there are two additional elements I'd like to add here. I would like to add a nice little curved element here. Uh, and I'd like to add a little top element here. So uh, where to begin? Let's see here. I'm going to actually use this guy here that looks like an arrow. And let's drag him onto the board. Let's drag him over here to the right. And I'm also going to use this little flower leaf looking thing. And let's drag that over on the board. And let's get the board front and center. Now, both of these objects are still on that other layer, so I'm going to select both of them, and I'm going to move them to my class project layer so um, they are there. All right. So now the funny thing about this is, is one of the things you'll have to get used to with Vetric and all is if I were to zoom out, Right now, you would think it zooms to the drawing limits, right? That it would show my board within full view. But what it does, it brings it way up here. And the reason being is because there is some hidden elements down here because of my farm fresh curve. If I go into that curve tool, you're going to see that angle based on that angle. This is the radius way down here. And so when I zoom out, you know, it's bringing my board way out here because it's bringing all of this into full view of my screen. So if you ever, if you ever, um, you know, are trying to like get it to fill the screen and all of a sudden it shoots way off in the back, it's like, wait a minute, that there's an element here and most likely it's going to be due to that or actually there's vectors down there somewhere that, um, <clears throat> you know, that you got to deal with, you know, and everything and everything. All right. All right. And so basically how I circumvent that is when I, you know, when I'm out here, I just select my border, right. And use the zoom to selected object. And that'll bring my board into full screen. 
Okay. All right. So uh, Tennessee Wood Sign says, can't you just offset outwards? And if I was dumb enough to, was I offsetting inward? I was. <laughs> yes, Tennessee Wood Signs, I could offset outward, but I was offsetting inward like a goofball. Thank you very much for pointing out my uh, idiocracy there, my, idiot, my, my, my stupidness. All right, let's offset outwards and uh, let's uh, change that. Let's uh, delete the original and offset outwards. And, you know, that could make our lines a little wider and stuff. So this is before. This is after. Right. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, so not bad at all. But, yeah, offset outward. Works like a champ. <laughs> All right. Thank you for pointing that out to me. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So let's get up here and let's work with our two elements. So this element here, uh, what I'm kind of reminded of with this is a curtain rod. Right. And this is the end of the curtain rod here. So we're going to make it a little bit bigger. About like that. Um, and... Um, Let's see what happened if I offset that outward. Outward, delete the original. Ooh, made it nice and bold. All right, so we'll deal, we'll deal with that. On this guy here, might as well keep everything consistent. Let's go ahead and offset that outward, delete the original. And let me see, do I like that? I don't like that. So I'm going to keep him like that. I like the little branches and the leaves. So, but this one I will change. Now, once again, uh, I'm going to go ahead and mirror this object to the other side. So mirror, creating that copy, flipping about job center and flip it to the other side here. And I'm going to use my rectangle tool and I'm going to draw a rectangle between these two things, making that curtain rod. Um, now, I would like this uh, rectangle to be a little skinnier. So I'm going to drag this down a bit and I'm going to use my up arrow keys and just kind of pull it in there. That looks good. Got that nice little bit of overlap over there. Nice little bit of overlap over there. And so I can now come in with my trim tools and I could even use my weld tool on this uh, to weld these parts together uh, just to show you that if I select this object here and this object here I can weld them together and achieve the same thing as my interactive trim tool all right so I got my curtain rod and no curtain rod is complete without some kind of center element there <laughs> so I'm going to use my uh, number zero key to rotate this clockwise and I'm actually going to bring the little circle here I'm going to bring that circle kind of at the center and all. Now, before I assume that I'm centered on this rod, I'm actually going to use my alignment tool and just make sure that I align to material and I am centered. So that's good. Now, on this guy here, I'd like to have a bit of uh, a bigger, a little bit of a bigger design. So I'm going to hold down my shift key and scale that up. A little bit the proportions and on here I'd like to have my line kind of come in and wrap around uh, this object here and here so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take my object here and let's get it centered use my alignment tool get it centered there and I'm going to take this object and I'm going to offset it just like we were doing a moment ago. I'm going to offset it uh, outward uh, a small amount um, and I'm not going to delete the original. OK, so I'm only offsetting it by just a, you know, a few thousandths of an inch. Let's go 0 0.02 here. 0 0.02. Just a small amount. Uh, to kind of get this round uh, shape and all going in there. Now, I'm not going to keep this offset. I'm not going to keep this offset, but I'm going to use this offset 
for these arcs right here. Okay. And so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with my trim tool, my trim tool, and where this line uh, comes in to this offset out here, uh, I'm going to trim that away. Uh, where it comes in here, I'm going to trim that away. I'm going to trim this away, and I'm going to trim this away. Continuing this line, continuing this line, I'm going to get rid of it here. So that line is going to curve into my arc, and I'm going to get rid of it here. And so now this line is joined all the way around on that, that vector, that curvature. So I have that nice little curve coming around. Now, on this, I want to undo everything that I just did because I'm trimming to the wrong vector, dude. Uh, the offset I'm getting rid of. I want to trim to uh, this curve, that inner curve there. Uh, and I, before I go too crazy with this, I need to do one last thing. So before I go too crazy with this, I need to move these leaves. I want to move them down. I want to kind of angle them downward. So I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm going to cut the vector on this top of this arc right here and over here on the same side as well. And that's going to cut this lower section of this leaf. Uh, from the rest of my design. And then on this vector here, I'm actually going to split the circle in half, cut it there. And in my selection mode now, I've got two halves here. And I can go ahead now, and if I double click on it, if I click on this center box on this selected object here, I'm in transform mode. If I click on this center box, it's going to show me my pivot point. And I would actually like uh, to pivot based off roughly the center of this circle here. And now I can pivot that arc around where I want this leaf and everything. And where I'd like this leaf is I'm going to bring it down ever so slightly right about here. And the same thing with this. If I double click on it and put it in transform mode, single click on that middle box, I can now hold down my mouse and drag my pivot point to this location and I can pivot this around and so you know i don't it doesn't have to be uniform i don't want it uniform i want a little bit of organicness to it and everything so we'll go right about there okay now what i've ended up doing here is i've got two different kind of circles and no connections and everything here and i'm simply going to use my circle tool and i'm going to roughly sketch out another circle okay I'm going to roughly sketch out another circle here and notice that I'm more over here than I am over there. That's because, you know, this shape is not like perfectly symmetrical and stuff. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, I'm going to reduce the size a little bit and I'm going to bump it over with my arrow keys just a little bit to the right, just to somewhat get it somewhat centered. And now, now I can come in and do my trimming. So it looks crazy right now, right? Got all these leaves. If I wanted double leaves, I could have done that, you know, made a copy, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what I want. So I want to go into my scissor tool here and I'm going to trim away. This was my original offset. This shape, I'm literally getting rid of that original offset all the way around here working with one line at a time, basically to uh, eliminate that as, you know, come in here and get rid of that. That should have gotten rid of all of that, which it did. And all I have left is that little piece there. Now, now my upper line, this line here 
it's going to trim into that shape. Okay, so it's going to curve into that shape. Got a little bit of a non-extension there. Uh, if I close my join tool, you see how it snapped it together for me? That's because the rejoin trim sections automatically when the form is closed. Meaning when I close my tool, it, it snapped that together, that slight little overlap that it created or, or, or shortcoming it created. Hey, Dave Gatton, how you doing, buddy? Uh, good to see you drop in on us there. And so now my curtain rod line is going all the way around. I need to connect it to this upper part. So we're going to trim away this overlap here, trim that away and that away. Again, got a little bit of an overlap there, but if I close this tool, you see how it snapped that together and everything. So now, I, now my line is continuously going around. It's going to come down to here. So that means I need to trim away this and this. And basically all of this center area I don't need. Okay. Okie dokie. All right. Now down here, my line is running into this uh, leaf here. Okay. And so it's going to kind of... Uh, join with this leaf down out here. So I want to come in with my trim tool and I want to trim away this vector here and that. So I got kind of this shape going on here and let's go over here and rinse and repeat over here. And then in here, just get rid of these lines this is coming in, get rid of this straight line all the way across. Trim away this and now my line is going to come in and it's going to wrap around. So these two lines here can go away. So it's wrapping around and then it's going to curve in to this angled line. Okay. It's going to wrap around and curve into that angled line. And then once again, we'll trim that away. Okay. So that's going to create this shape here. Now I want to take my circle tool again and I'm going to come in here and I actually do want like a little center bead. So I'm going to draw another circle in there. So I want that like little decorative element here. Now I could get fancy and I could throw these leaves up here. So they were kind of curving up here as well underneath these. Um, if I were, if I were doing that, basically uh, what I would do is, oops, what I would do is I would literally draw a line, right? Draw a line from here to here. And that gives me kind of uh, my line here. And in my line tool, I can now snap, snap to the center of this line and I can draw this line all the way across. Oops. <laughs> Did you see how it snapped to that? Escape. Uh, let's not do that. Control Z. One more time. Snap over there and drag that straight across and space bar to finish. So I have this line here. And what I could do is I could very simply quickly go into node editing mode, cut the vector here, cut the vector right here on this black node, zoom in if it's uh, won't let you cut. There we go. Cutting that leaf loose there over here. Do the same thing. Cut the vector right here and right here at this corner. And I could take these two objects, get out of node editing mode, these two objects here. I could use my copy and paste, which is up here. Or I could right click and use my copy and paste here. Or I could use the keyboard shortcuts of control C and control V. Now, if I take this and I go control C, that's copy these objects. 
okay? So now I can take those objects, grab them both, and grab my line here, okay, that line. And in my mirror tool, I have an object to flip about line. And if I flip it about that line, it's going to flip it up because that line is centered here. It's going to flip it up into place there, um, you know, uh, right where it you know, needs to be. And now when I did that, um, I had the create mirrored copy already selected. But if I would not have had the create mirrored copy selected and I flipped that about that line, if you remember, I copied those objects before I mirrored them. So if I hit my paste, control V, it's going to uh, put that object back. So once again, let's undo that. With those selected, I'm going to go control C for copy. Okay, on these objects here. Control C for copy. I'm going to come in and nothing mirror there. I'm just going to select that line and flip about the line. And when I come over here and hit control V, it will put that copied parts right back where they were. Okay. So now with this, I wouldn't want, I can get rid of my line now, right? I was just using that for mirroring and stuff. And I got to remember to join these vectors back. So before I forget, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to select this object here, this object here, and this object here, and this one right here. And I'm going to go into my join tool and I've got four objects selected. And when I join it, I'll join them into one. Now I've got these here and I don't want them looking exactly like that. I mean, it looks like a, you know, a fish fin or anything. I want a little bit of kind of, you know, a little bit of difference or something. So what I may do is just bring these in. They don't have to be symmetrical or anything like that. And I may even rotate them ever so slightly. Bring it down, make it a little bit smaller. I can rotate this one ever so slightly. Bring that down a little bit. And give myself, I'm going to make it actually a little bit smaller. Oops, wrong box. A little bit smaller. Again, we're being graded. We don't have to, they don't have to be exactly the same size. And then all I need to do is come in here and trim away my overlaps to connect those objects together, you know, to create that little decorative element there in the center of my curtain rod. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So now that we have that, that takes care of everything down in the lower part of the sign. Now I want to come in and create my little decorative arch here. And earlier I said that I liked this little element here, right here. I think that looks like a windmill. Let's, let's turn it around. I think that looks like a little windmill, right? Windmill on a farm. That's so fitting. So I'm going to actually borrow that. And I'm actually not going to use these two uh, objects here. So we'll just turn that um, layer off in a minute and hide those. But I want to I want to use this. And I want to move it to my class project layer. So I'm working with it. And I can go and turn my other layer off. And so now with this, I'm going to size it up. I want a nice, not a big windmill, but a nice size looking windmill there. And uh, we'll get it in position in a moment. But what I'd like is I'd like to have a nice little arc uh, tying in into that over the word here. And again, guys, this is a Q&A. Ask questions. It doesn't have to be about this project. It can be about anything. And I'll answer as we go along. Just type them in. Um, you know, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my arc tool, draw arc, and I'm actually going to use my letters here to help me out. I'm just going to snap my uh, first point of my arc to the top of my F here, and I'm going to drag it over to my H here, and then I'm going to pull that arc up to the top of this F and basically kind of get that curve going on. I want to match that curve, if you will. OK, and now that I've matched that curve, I'm going to drag this up into this area. 
Okie dokie. Okie dokie. All right. Now I want to offset this line. Um, you know, I want to offset this line a bit. And let me, first of all, before I offset it, let me take and get it into the position that I want. I'm going to just overlap this ever so slightly here. And I'm going to offset this object inward a sixteenth of an inch. I do not need sharp corners. It's a straight line. And I want to select the new and I'm going to offset it inward roughly about a sixteenth of an inch. Now, I'm going to take both of these objects here. Shift in this one. And I'm just going to bump them down a little bit right about there. Okay, so now I've got these two objects here. All right. Now, I've got to tie these arcs into this area. So I'm simply going to kind of, I could weld the parts together as one. Uh, if I ungroup this, I should be able to select the overlapping areas uh, and my line here uh, and weld. But the only problem is this is a line. It's not a closed vector. So I'm not really welding two, two closed vectors together. So I need to trim because these lines are open at the end. So I need to trim. So we're just going to come in here, zoom in nice and tight. And very simply, all I'm going to do is tie my line into this and I want that arc. So I'm using the arc line. I'm keeping the arc line and I'm getting rid of everything else. Okay. So we're going to get rid of everything else, keeping that arc line all the way down to here. Okay. So basically that top line has now been joined with these vectors here, not the sunflowers, but not the petals, but you know, that or the way well, it's a fan, it's a windmill. So not the blades, <laughs> uh, but it's been, it's been joined to the rest of this object. All right, cool. All right. So now I'd like to do something a little decorative down here at the end. So I'm going to use my circle tool and I'm going to just pick a spot somewhere right about here. And I'm going to draw a nice, good size bead, if you will. Let's uh, give it a little bit of a bigger size there. Small little overlap. And if I mirror this, if everything is nice and if I'm centered, which I never did check to see if I was centered. So let's do that now. Let's select this object, turn off my circle. And let's go into the alignment tool and left and right center to the material. There we go. So now I'm centered. Now my windmill's not centered. And if that and if somebody's got OCD and that drives them crazy, then basically we're going to take a couple of steps back. So control Z, control Z all the way back till I get my separate lines here. And then I could take my object and make sure it's centered. Boom, falls right on that line. I could take my arcs, make sure that they're centered. Okay. And then I could very simply retrim those uh, lines and stuff. Okay. So let's ungroup that ungroup onto the group layer and use my trim tool and trim away these lines once again. All the way down to here. OK, so now everything looks a little bit more centered and uniform. So now I'm going to take my circle tool again once again and somewhere right about here. I'm going to draw a bead, not a big bead. That's a big bead. So we're going to make a smaller one probably about that size right there. And I'm going to mirror it to the other side. Mirror it, create a mirrored copy, flip about job center to the other side here. And then I'm going to simply trim those together, joining that 
here. Okay. All right. So now uh, Les uh, Douglas has a good question. He says, if the birds, if our chickens uh, are in a 3D format and the sign is in feet, not inches, how do I reduce the carve time? All right. So less, we've got two things going on here. If the birds are in 3D format and the sign is in feet, not inches, meaning the sign is eight feet or whatever versus eight inches, I'm assuming that's what you mean. How do I reduce the carve time? Well, a 3D format, a 3D model, depending on the size of that project and the detail in that project, you're going to uh, have a very long uh, carving time. Some of the things that you can do to reduce your carving time is uh, you can um, change your tools, feeds and speeds. Uh, you can, you know, adjust your step over, but you don't want to sacrifice your quality of your cut by reducing like the step overs and stuff. You want a nice tight step over in a 3D model. So it's, you got a nice carving, especially with ball nose bits and all. You don't want, you know, about an 8% step over is really good. But uh, I could safely go to about a 10 or 11 percent step over and still get a nice smooth cut and not see my actual radius groove marks in my in my model. But um, it really depends on the model itself and how much detail it is. If this sign being 22 inches and everything, if these were, you know, a 3D carving and stuff, one of the ways that I would uh, do my chickens, if they were 3D models, what I would do is on each of the chickens, because this is going to get pocketed out down here to an eighth of an inch. I know that ahead of time, right? So I know how deep my pocket's going to be. I could take my chickens here and I could create an offset boundary around them outward. Uh, we'll just go an eighth of an inch. And I could create that offset and then hold down your shift key after you create that offset and turn off that outside boundary because that's what we want. All this other stuff that was created we don't want so while it's still selected i'm gonna hit delete because now i have a boundary and when i'm creating my 3d toolpath there's no sense in my 3d model having to carve this whole thing just to carve those 3d chickens up all i need to do is when i'm creating my pocket cut that's going to pocket and flatten all this out to a certain depth i need that outside profile that i created protecting that area so that wood doesn't get carved away where my 3d model is going to get cut and then when I create my 3D tool path, I'm going to use the selected vector as the boundary because I only need to be focused on 3D carving the chickens. I don't need to 3D carve with that small bit this whole project. I just need to carve where the 3D model is. And my pocket depth is going to reflect how deep my 3D model cuts and everything. I'll give you an example. If I drag and drop a 3D model in here, 3D models, let's say it was a bass, and I have that bass size down to, you know, whatever size it's going to be. When I look at my, if I close my 3D finish tool here, if I look at my job setup, it will tell me how thick my model is, 0.2205. And that's my pocket depth. That's what I need to carve this pocket depth to. Because my 3D model cut, if I was 3D modeling this, it would carve that pocket all the way down to that 0.2205. So I just need to do a pocket cut with my end mill. It's a 2D toolpath that'll be much faster to that depth. And then do my 3d cut just on the 3d models and it's going to bring that down to that pocket area and blend everything in nice and smooth. So I hope that answers your question. I know it was a little bit uh, long, but I hope that answers your question. Let's turn that off and everything. Okay. So now we were up here on our arc and let me close this clip art tool here. Now, I said I wanted to do something decorative on this end here. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to go into, I'm going to select my top arc here, and I'm going to go into node editing mode. And right 
about here, just picking a random spot, I'm going to insert a point. Okay. Now, if I insert a point here, how in the world do I know that it's going to be uh, that I insert it in the right place over here? Because, uh, you know, the simple fact is, is I can't mirror a, a point that I'm aware of. We could try. You want to try? Let's see if we try to let's see if we can mirror a point. Uh, so if I got a point selected, let me see if I can mirror a point. Nope. 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 It won't let me. So what I need to do is basically um, let's go back into node editing mode. I'm going to use a guideline and I'm going to snap a guideline to that point here. And if I right click on that guideline, I'll get the properties box. And basically the position is 0.61124 negative, right? Well, if I come down here and create a relative guide in a positive direction, positive point 61124, then that's going to give me a guideline over here where I need to be. And all I have to do now is go into node editing mode, put my mouse right on that line on that guideline and insert a point. Okay, so that way I can make sure they're both in the right direction. Now, one of the things that you may or may not know, when we insert a point, you know, we have a Bezier curve happening here and we have two anchor nodes that are like a sawhorse. When I move this up this way, this one moves down. OK, so it's like a teeter totter. Well, I don't want that to happen. OK, I want my arc to remain. And the reason why it teeter totters like this is because that this node here is set to a smoothing point. And if I turn off that smooth point, my node will turn black. And now I can manipulate one anchor at a time, whatever one I want to change. And so what I want to change is this one. Okay. What I'd like is I'd like a nice, almost like a little broadhead arrow, like a nice little arc here. Okay, almost like a little broadhead arrow. Let's pull this up a little bit more like that. <clears throat> okay. And now I want that same shape that I've just created. And let's come in here and uh, let's take and right at this curve right here. Let's insert a point right here. And turn this Bezier curve into a line, a straight line. Let's pull this down just a bit so it's kind of in line with this. I'm not going to bring it down to here yet. I'll show you how I'll deal with that. But um, I just wanted to kind of somewhat follow that arc there for a moment. Now, I want that same shape on the other side here. So I'm simply going to go into my node editing I'm simply going to cut the vector on that point that I created for the moment so I can select this object and now I can mirror that and flip it horizontally to the other side. And so now I have that shape on the other side here. I got to remember to come back in and join where I cut. So I'll use the join tool to join where I cut and I got to come back over here. And I don't have to do any joining or anything here. All I have to do, because I haven't cut anything over here, all I have to do is use my trim tool and trim there and the overlap there. Okay. So now I have this shape. Now on my lower arc, I'd like to give myself a little bit more room because it's going to change in just a moment. But I'm going to use my down arrow key and bump that down just a little bit more. Okay. Okay. Just give myself a little bit of room here because I'm going to take both of these objects now and I'm going to use this tool here, which is the join or close by bringing the two endpoints to a common point of intersection. Basically, it's going to bring these two points to a midpoint here and connect them together. So if I join, it's going to bring them points together. And if I click it again, join 
by bringing those endpoints together, it's going to bring them together. Okay. So now I've got this little funky little hook here and it's the same on both sides. If I go into node editing mode on this object, I don't need that point right there. So if I simply delete that point, it'll smooth that curve out for me. Okay. If I come back over here and delete that point, it'll smooth that curve out for me. Okay. Give me a nice little shape. And I just wanted to create this little decorative shape. And, you know, however, you know, I could play around with the curve. I could make it, you know, much wider or broader. And I could give it a little bit more of a curl. All these kind of things. But I'm happy with that general shape overall for my sign. So with that, that completes our sign, the layout of our sign. Okay. And so... Um, the node, oh, I'm still in node editing mode. Let's get out of node editing mode and I'm going to delete those two objects there. So let's take a look. I'm going to select my border here so I can zoom into that border. So it brings my shot full screen. And this is the sign that we have created. Uh, a really nice uh, farm sign that uh, is just going to, uh, you know, make the uh, customer happy. Uh, whatever the case may be, you know, those little decorative touches just give it a little bit of class, a little bit of pizzazz, a little bit of character. And um, it's really going to, you know, make a difference. Uh, instead of having just farm fresh eggs carved in there with a couple of chickens, we kind of dressed it up a bit, you know, you uh, know, before we go into uh, creating the tool pass and the texturing and everything, uh, let's answer another question here. Um can you grab, can you just grab the nodes on both sides and move them in sync? Um, I thought I did that once, but I may be wrong. And so what uh, Tennessee is referring to here is uh, if I were in here in node editing, and let's say that I had this node, not these three. If I had just this node selected, and just this node selected, could I move them in sync? I mean, yes, with them selected, I could move them in sync. You know, uh, I'm using my arrow keys and stuff. Um, it all depends on what it is that you're, you know, wanting to do. Um, and let me get back to where I was originally. And, um, but yeah, you could, uh, you, you, I mean, if that's what you're referring to, uh, Tennessee is if you're wanting to move them in sync, you can, you can, you can select two nodes, especially like if I had my, you know, my rectangle, um, if I had a, oops, if I had a rectangle here and I was in node editing mode. You know, I could grab, you know, multiple nodes and I could move them in sync, you know, uh, to stretch them out. Uh, if I had um, the object selected, when I drag on one versus the other, I, you know, I can manipulate that shape any way that I need to. Uh, like if I was trying to create a parallelogram or something or what have you, you know, I could do that. Um so, yes, you can move uh, nodes in sync by selecting multiple nodes at the time. Okay. All right. So, if we now come over into the toolpath side of the software, and let's close this material setup here. If we come into here, um, if I were to just V-carve this, maybe a V-carve bit, a V-bit, you know, doing a nice little border V-cut, a profile cut on that border, and then V carve this sign, it wouldn't actually look too bad. So let's take a look at what that would look like. If I grab my little chickens and everything here and I V carve this, I'm going to give myself a little bit of a start depth, about 10,000 of an inch, so I can get some little definition out of my thinner lines and everything here. Uh, and I'm going to not have a uh, flat depth, no flat depth on this. I'm going to use a 60 degree V bit 
and uh, I'm going to calculate this out. And all right, it says the selective vector may contain overlaps. So one of my vectors has an overlap. Let's find that real quick. Let's go to the vector validator and let's uh, come in and search our selected and find out where our overlap is. And they're all kind of right in here, right? There, there's tons and tons of overlaps and everything here. And there's no uh, simple way to um, come in and click, you know, to, to choose that and stuff. Um, and what my overlap is, is I have a duplicate. That's why there are so many overlaps in that one area. I have a duplicate. And you can tell because it's here, but when it wraps around, when it's joined together, uh, my original design, my original design came back into play. So I need to simply select that original design and how I can tell it's the original, it's the one that's not connected to my two borders, right? So if I come in here and select this line here, that's that original design that got duplicated. If I delete that, I can now come in and make sure that I don't have duplicates. And all of these are duplicates right now. And the reason why they're duplicates and stuff is because when I ungroup them before, when it was popping up all those other things, it was bringing that group in and uh, it was, um, you know, creating, you see my uh, vectors on. And now with that turned off, notice that the duplicates have gone away. So my original design and my copy were on top of each other. Okay. So if I turn that layer off, I don't have those duplicates any longer. Okay. So little things like that we have to be mindful of and we have to catch and stuff. Uh, and, um, you know, there's always a reason for something. And that vector validator, you know, when it showed me all of those vectors, all of those overlaps, knowing that this is a straight line and there's no possible way I could have a bunch of segments and stuff that pointed to an overlap. And the best way to tell an overlap is when you have it selected, your pink dotted line should have a white background behind it. If it's got a black background behind it, then you have a duplicate vector, another vector right behind it that's the same. Okay, it should be a nice dotted clear white line. Okie dokie, okie dokie. All right, so let's, uh, again, once again, we'll zoom into our border here to bring us full center here. Uh, zoom, there we go. And I'm going to select my entire object minus my border, not my border, just my entire object here. And we're going to continue that V-carve toolpath. And <clears throat> all right, what else got duplicated? So let's go through and find what else was duplicated. Down here, overlap. And this intersection is not a duplicate. It's simply a, when I uh, set the, um, when I did the offset, it made these two lines cross. Okay. So I only have six intersections. So one on this side, one over here, they're identical. And so all I have to do is come in here and clean this up. Now, how I'm going to clean that up is I'm going to go into node editing mode. Stop. I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm simply going to drag this shape apart okay i'm simply going to just drag it apart and how far apart do you drag it you know so this side matches and all that stuff um you can use your guidelines and everything all i'm going to do is uh, i'm just going to eyeball it so basically i'm bringing this one a little bit past the one on the left and then i'm bringing this one about to where that other one was that's it just a very simple thing. It's not going to make a difference. My balls are still the same. <laughs> my balls are, my uh, uh, circles there are still the same size. You know, it's not changing anything. It's just opening up and getting rid of that overlap is what we're doing. Okay. We're clearing that path. All right. Once again, for the final time, we're going to zoom in and we're going to select our object and we're going to calculate that toolpath. 
and now we have no overlaps, no errors, no nothing. It should calculate just fine. All right. So with that, if we preview that visible toolpath, we'll have this nice little uh, V cut sign if we were V carving it this way, but we're not, we're not going to, um, we're not going to use that. Uh, let's turn off our uh, material color for a minute. So if I were to color this, you know, if I were to give this a little bit of a color, whatever, uh, everything kind of pops. Let's get our border in there. That border, it's a single line profile. Uh, so it's a profile toolpath. I'm going to go an eighth of an inch with that same 60 degree V bit right on the line. And I'm going to calculate that toolpath for that border. And if we preview that, all in all, you know, that's a nice, simple little V cut sign. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, we're, uh, let's turn the color off and let's, uh, let's change this from oak for a minute to maple. We get a nice clean look at it and everything, but nothing wrong with that as a V cut sign at all. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be ashamed to uh, do a simple sign like this to sell at the craft fair or the, you know, the market or what have you uh, and, and stuff. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to give this a little bit of depth and some texture. Okay. Now, Mike says, uh, what question mark? So Mike Smith, I might have mumbled on something. So kind of tell me on what part are you asking what? unless you're not talking to me and talking to one of the guys in the group. <laughs> so if you say what, what, uh, what's it to, what's, what's the rest of the question? That way I can answer it properly. Uh, fill that in or, or tell me what that is in the chat and I'll answer it properly. Cause I don't know, uh, with everything I said, what you're asking what to. Okay. All right. So now, this is a very simple V cut sign. Nothing wrong with, like I said, we got some nice little decorative elements and everything. If we were to paint this sign and give it some, you know, color and all or what have you, and I'm just doing kind of a grass green color there, you know, uh, but uh, you know, wouldn't look too bad, right? Not bad at all, but let's do it a little bit different. What I'd like to do on this sign is I'd like to select my entire project and carve that. But before I do, I want to look at my cut here. And I like the way the chickens are carved. I like the way they look. So I want to maintain that. Okay. Um, uh, I, I want to maintain that look. And in order to do that, if I create a V-carve toolpath with that border selected, it's going to reverse this cut. So everything that's carved down would be up and everything that's up would be carved down. And I do not want that. So what I want to do is I want to create a outside profile of my chickens. I want to give them an extra line since I'm sitting here, you know, carving this way and they carve a V carved toolpath cuts between the lines. So it's cutting between these lines, leaving all this raised, cutting between these lines, you know, and, and everything. So it's just cars between the lines. Well, once I add another line into the mix, now it's carving between this line and this line, leaving this raised, carving between this line and this line, leaving all these little stubs raised, and it would not look good. Um, if we want to see what this would look like without adding the border around it, we can simply do that right now. Let's take a look at if we do not add a little island around our chickens, what our design looks like uh, as is. So once again, take a quick look here. You see our chickens, see our farm fresh eggs and everything. Now everything is going to be reversed, even the chickens, because I'm not going to create the profiles yet. So let's do it. So uh, V-Carve Toolpath, this time I definitely have to add a flat depth. I got a big gap here. You know, there's a lot of, it'll, it'll, I'm V-Carving. So I'm going to go an eighth of an inch deep, eighth of an inch. I'm going to use my 60 degree V-Bit. Now I have a lot of area to carve here. And with V-10, I can choose multiple flat area clearance tools. My quarter inch end mill is going to do a majority of that flat area. It's going to knock it out. Wherever my 
uh, end mill doesn't fit, my V-bit would take over if that was the only end uh, tool that I'm using, clearance tool. Wherever it can't fit, my V-bit would take over and try to flatten those areas out. But what I would like is I would like to also use an eighth inch and a sixteenth inch. So my quarter inch will do all the heavy area. Where it can't fit, the eighth inch is going to carve where it can fit. And then my sixteenth is going to touch up the last little bit. So I'm going to have three tool paths here, uh, four technically, uh, that are going to use different bits. And V10 gives us that ability to do that now versus just a V bit and an end mill for our flat clearance tool. Now I can use multiple clearance tools to really get into the fine detail. So I'm going to calculate this as is no borders around, you know, no boundaries around the, uh, the chickens, not the ducks. And let's carve this. Okay. And let it calculate. It's coming. All right. So if we look at this, and I'm going to double click on my, because my I've got my screen size so large so you guys can see everything clearly. I want to double click on, by the way, if you uh, double click on the toolpath, let me close this. The word toolpath right here, if you double click on it, it'll open up a floating window of your toolpaths and stuff. And that way I can kind of see them. So basically, if we look at this, I've got a flat area clearance tool of my quarter inch bit that's going to do a majority of the work. My eighth inch bit is going to come in and get in the areas that it can fit. My sixteenth inch is going to come in and get into the areas that my eighth inch bit couldn't fit. And then my V bit is going to come do the final touch up. Okay. So let's come in here and let's preview this cut. So if we preview, let's reset the preview to a blank board and preview this visible toolpath. Now what my focus is on this, what my focus is, is on the chickens. I know that I'm not going to like the way the chickens look, the chicken and the eggs. I want them to carve the way they did originally. If I, you know, did just a simple V carve, but now they're going to be reversed. So my quarter inch end mill is running through and I have my, uh, you know, settings up high. So it's a little bit slower. Um, but my eighth inch bit is going to come in and touch up those areas it can do. And then my 16th inch is going to get into the tight areas that it can do. And then my V bit is going to come back and do all the V carve work and everything. So let's uh, let it wrap up here. And now let's turn off the color so we can really look at this. Now, if we look at the chickens, that's my main thing. Everything that was once carved down originally is now carved up and everything that was carved up is carved down. And I do not like the way the chickens look. They look weak. They look pitiful and everything and all that. Uh, everything else, I love the way it looks, you know. So what we're going to do is to circumvent that is on our chickens, we're going to ungroup them first, ungroup, okay? And I'm going to just right-click and ungroup to this layered object here. I'll do the same thing on this one, ungroup to the layered object here. And on my boundary, this boundary here, that's what I want to create a vector, uh, uh, an offset of. And basically, I'm going to be creating an island for my chickens to get carved into, if you will. And so I'm going to offset, and I'll select both of them and do them both at the same time. I'm going to offset them outward uh, probably an eighth of an inch. Yeah, I'll go an eighth of an inch. Sixteenth uh, wouldn't look bad either, but I'll go... Let's go, uh, I don't want to go a 16th. The 16th is too small. Uh, I'm going to go uh, point. Da -dum -dum, oh, eight. There we go. And basically what I've done is I've created this island around the object. Now, I want you to look at something. 
I when I did the offset, not only did it offset my outside boundary, but it also offset a little vector right here. That's an extra vector that I don't want. OK, so what I want to do is I'm going to hold down my shift key. Deselect the border. That's because I want to keep it. I'm going to leave that selected. I'm going to come over here and do the same thing. Deselect my boundary. Keep that there. And then I'm just going to simply hit the delete key on my keyboard to delete those other offset lines that would, would have been created. OK, so now I have a basically an island around my chickens that will uh, allow me to carve them normally. So let's go and let's do this again. We're going to select everything now. We're going to come in and I'm going to just reopen that toolpath. We're going to select everything now this time. Still eighth inch start depth or, or 10 thousandths of an inch start depth, eighth inch cut depth. Uh, my 60 degree V bits doing the V cut work and then my end mills are doing the flat work. We're going to calculate this now, let it run through. And while that does that, um, let's see here. Is there a list somewhere of all the keyboard shortcuts? Jeff Norland asked the question, is there a list somewhere of all the keyboard shortcuts? Yes. There are two ways that you can, you can find out about the keyboard shortcuts, Jeff, and, uh, let this calculate real quick and we'll, go in here. So number one is under your help menu. Keyboard shortcuts is a complete sheet. It'll open up a document of all the keyboard shortcuts uh, within uh, the software, depending on what you're doing, like the mirroring keyboard shortcuts, the aligning, the grouping and ungrouping and note editing and stuff, all the keyboard shortcuts that are available. But also uh, uh, with that, if you were, um, if we close that, if you were looking at the uh, manual on a tool, if we were looking at the manual on a tool, um, when we're looking at the page about the a particular tool, if we scroll down, it shows the quick keys and it shows the keyboard shortcuts that's used for that tool. Okay. Now this looks like, oh my God, a whole lot of keyboard shortcuts and stuff. And basically it's not. So in this case, we would type in uh, the, the width is always first when we're doing a rectangle and all. Radius is first if we have radiuses and all. But let's say we're making a square rectangle. The width is always first. So we type in a value followed by a comma. And then we type in the height value followed by the enter key. Okay. And so what that means is as far as those keyboard shortcuts go, is if I were drawing a rectangle, I could start drawing and hold down my left mouse button and type in my, if I type in four comma six enter, that's going to give me that four by six rectangle. Okay. So you can see the keyboard shortcuts uh, for the tools by looking at them individually, or you can get the whole sheet of them here. Okay. All right, so let's get back to our 3D view now and let's reset the preview and let's preview the visible tool pass and let's take a look at what we've got now that we've created those islands around our chicken and eggs. And th th that goes for anything, anything that you want to carve normally when you're doing this raised effect, anything that you want to carve normally because it just looks better create a boundary around that, an offset of it or what have you, and it'll create that island that it'll get, uh, the objects will get carved on. So there's my islands and now my chickens are getting carved into that island. So now my chickens in this island that was created, my chickens getting carved into that. So I get that nice looking chicken. Now, because of that offset and everything, I'm a little close here, right? little close here and I'm, I'm definitely close on the border of the butt, you know, there I have to decide for myself looking at my design. Am I okay with that? Am I okay being that close or do I want to size my chickens down a little bit or move them a little, or do I want to size down my eggs, uh, sign eggs and everything and change that? What I'd like to do on this is, ouch, um, 
I would like to take this guy and I want to bump him up a little bit. So the point is kind of right at the neck here. And no sense in uh, why draw what you can copy. I'm simply going to select uh, this and mirror it back over to the other side. Okay. And then I'd like to take this object here. Not my little chicken faces. Hold on a second now. Uh, I don't want to select my chickens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to group them together. Same thing over here. I'm going to group this together. So that way when I'm grabbing this object here, it's not going to select the chickens. And what I'd like to do is uh, this object here. I'm going to take and uh, the curtain rod, I'm actually going to keep the size that it is. And on this object here, I'm simply going to reduce it inward a little bit. Not much, not much. I don't want a whole lot of change. I'm going to reduce it inward a bit. And I'm going to recalculate the tool pass. Okay. So I'm going to recalculate those tool pass. Now my chickens aren't selected anymore because I just deleted them and made a copy and all that stuff. And so all we're going to do is simply recalculate that tool path. And that way those uh, little arrows aren't stabbing into the chickadoos faces and all that stuff and everything looks good. Um, and uh, hold on a second. Uh, is it me? Okay, I was wrong. Oh no, Galissa, you're not. You weren't wrong. Um, let's uh, let's preview the visible toolpaths once again, and this will be our final design, except for the texture. And this is what I want to talk to you about: is the texture, texturing. To really just take this sign, I mean, it's going to look good as it is, as it's carving, but I'd like to add a little bit of texture to it. All right, so my 16th inch end mill is going in and touching up all those areas and stuff. And then my V bit's going to come and do all the V carve work and everything. And, you know, as it stands, if I gave it a little bit of color and everything, then I would have this kind of nice raised design here. Okay, with all these nice little decorative elements and stuff. See my windmill? I swear it looks like a windmill, right? It looks like a windmill on the farm. Um, Another way of doing this is doing actual an actual barn on this art, you know, a nice little barn or something up there. Uh, but let's turn the color off for a minute. And, you know, as it stands, uh, this is a decent looking sign. Nothing wrong with it at all. But I'd like to give it a little bit of character. One more last little bit of character with the texturing. Now, we have a tool over here called a uh, vector texture tool to create a vector texture patterns. And it's based on lines. The angle of lines, uh, the line spacing, how, how they space apart, the wavelength, you know, on the waviness of them, how wavy they are and how long those waves are, the amplitude and the wavelength. And then we could have them smooth curvy lines or noise and distorted curvy lines and all. And we could create a pattern in here to create a kind of a random pattern of a texture. And in conjunction with that, we could use our texturing toolpath. Uh, to follow and cut those lines and stuff. And uh, we could create a pattern. Now, I'm not a fan, me personally, I'm not a fan of this. You can create some really nice textures and everything with it. I'm not a fan of it because of the simple fact of if I selected my vectors here, okay, these are the kind of, this is the area that I want to create this pattern in and stuff. It's going to bring these pattern lines right up to my letters and everything. Uh, those pattern lines, there's no offset distance and stuff. And there's no offset in here where I can stay away from my selected vectors by a certain amount. In my texturing tool, there is. I can say, hey, stay an eighth of an inch away from all of my selected vectors. And my path, my little texturing will not come near my letters and stuff. Um, if I created this vector pattern, 
which we'll do, we'll go ahead and create a vector pattern. I'm just gonna use these same settings here and I'm gonna create kind of almost like a simulated wood grain or what have you, right? You see how those lines go right up to my vectors. I would have to offset every one of my vectors, create a protective boundary around it by the amount that I don't want these lines to come to, if you will, and then go back and delete them. And that's easily done, you know, it's easily doable. Basically, like, remember this offset I created? Basically, my lines would go up to there, and then I could, you know, delete this line, and now I have that open space in between. Well, I don't want to do that. And if I use my texturing tool, I'd love to be able to use the boundary offset tool and say, hey, you know, just stay away from the boundary. But the minute I say, the minute I say use selected vectors as the pattern, it grays out everything except for the cut depth, even my offset, right? So I can't offset. So I'm not a big fan, and I'm also not a big fan of the symmetrical kind of looking lines and stuff. So I'm going to undo that. Let it undo those vector lines. Give it a second. Okay. So I'm not a fan of that. I'm a fan of just using the vector texture tool in all of its glory. So I'm going to select all of my objects here. Okay. Now on these objects, I technically uh, do not need... Let me ungroup this and let me ungroup this. Okay. On my objects here, I need my border selected. I need my text selected. I need my profile here selected. I don't need that little end dot in there selected. I'm not going to carve any texture in there. Uh, I need my outside boundary of uh, this, um, this box. I don't need all the inside stuff. I'm just protecting this area from getting textured. I need this selected and I need my outside of my chicken selected. I'm just basically telling the texture tool that don't go into this area, right? All I need to do is select the boundaries. I don't have to select everything. Now up here, my windmill, I don't want texture in my fins. So I'm actually going to add those in there too. And this and that. Okay. So these are the things that I want to texture around, okay? Now, technically, I don't need eggs selected either because it's inside of this border. So this is protecting all of this inside area here. So I don't need that, just all of this. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to use a 16th inch tapered ball nose. You can use any bit with the texturing toolpath to get different looks. A V bit is kind of choppy and slicey looking. Uh, an end mill, a flat end mill is going to be um, uh, more uh, kind of chunky. A ball nose bit is almost like a spoon scooping out the wood and stuff. Uh, so I like using the ball nose bit. It gives a nice looking texture. And um, what I'm going to do is this has been pocketed out to an eighth of an inch. So that's where I want to start this texturing down an eighth of an inch at the bottom of that pocket. I would like the cut depth to vary between an eighth of an inch and the minimum depth of roughly under about a 16th of an inch. I want it to vary between these. So these little lines and these rulers here are vari variables. So it's going to the maximum cut depth and the minimum cut depth. My cut length, I'd like my lines to be about one inch in length. You know, when it's when that bit is cutting one inch in length. So one inch, one inch, one inch. And with a minimum of about three eighths, you know, 0 0.375. My overlap, I'm going to let those lines overlap one another by about, uh, you know, 20%. And then I'm going to step over from one line to the next when it's stepping over in things. I'm going to step over a 16th of an inch, about the basically about the distance of my ball nose uh, with a variance of uh, 0.015. So it's really going to just create a really random pattern. I'm going to have a straight angle. I want this to kind of almost simulate wood grain or what have you, or a really rough texture across there. So I'm going to have it go straight. 
you can get a really different dramatic effect by going at a different angle and stuff, but I'm going to go straight. So a zero angle, but I do not want my ball nose bit hitting my letters or my islands or my border or any of that stuff. So I'm going to say, Hey, we want to stay away by about an eighth of an inch. And how I came up with that number is in the 3d view because of my 60 degree V bit that offset from the top of my objects to the bottom that angled offset here, that angled offset is roughly a little under an eighth of an inch. It's a lot, it's about like 0 0.1077. So if I say stay an eighth of an inch away from my objects, it's actually staying an eighth of an inch away from the top of the object, not the angle down here, but the top. So my texture will cut right up to this object and not cut into it down here at the bottom. <coughs> so, with that, I'm going to calculate this texture toolpath. And we're going to call it final texture. And I always put the word optional, right? I always throw the word optional in my texture uh, because, uh, shuttle, because it tells me that, you know, I could do this texture or not do this texture, you know, and have two different completely looking signs. So I always throw that in there because it's an optional. It's an option. I like the option. I like the way it looks. It is going to be a long run time. Don't get me wrong on that one. Don't get me twisted. It is a long, long run time, uh, but it's worth it um, in my eyes. Now, the first time somebody uses the texturing toolpath and it creates the texture and they see these lines, they're like, holy cow. It's carving over my letters because they're seeing all these red lines covering all of their objects and everything. What you have to know is the blue areas are the areas that are getting carved. The green areas are where the router is raising up and down. And the red areas are where the router is traveling above the material from one point to the next. So it's actually carving over those objects from one point to the next. So it's not carving into your objects and everything. All right. So once again, let's uh, let's kind of get this full screen here uh, somewhat and let's turn off that toolpath for a minute. Let's take a good look. This is without a texture. Again, nothing wrong with it. Now let's go ahead and throw in our texture and see what we get. Just a nice little slight little choppy background. Uh, kind of give it a little bit of roughness, a little bit of age and everything, uh, you know, around it. You can see that it's staying an eighth of an inch away from my uh, areas and my border and everything. And so we have a nice little textured background with different depths and different, you know, that little 16th inch ball nose just went in there. And if I used an eighth inch ball nose, it'd be much wider spoons, right? Little scoops. If I used a quarter inch ball nose, they would be even bigger scoops, almost like a chisel scoop type of thing. So we can, different bits give you different dramatic results and stuff. But I wanted to be able to get a little bit of texture in between this farm fresh and all. So my 16th inch uh, ball nose bit is perfect for creating those little slices and everything. And it just gives it a little bit more character on that sign. So now if I were to paint this, spray paint it and then sand off the excess off the top, uh, whatever color and everything uh, it would be. And I don't know why I'm kind of stuck on the green tonight, but it would look something about like this. Now let's change this to oak. Let's say we were carving this in oak and and all. And, um, you know, that would be your sign. Another good color. Let's say that we were doing kind of a washed out color. Uh, kind of a wash, a white wash. Not that great of a color, but, you know, something like that. A little white wash going on there. Now, 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 how now, brown cow. Um, let's go back to our green. Ooh, not that green. A little something like that. A little subtle green. Where's more colors, more colors, colors, colors. Colors everywhere. You know? Okay. 
some kind of funky looking green. So it's a nice looking sign um, and everything. Uh, so still no way to make the depth deeper in between the letters. So uh, Tennessee is asking, can we make the texture any deeper in between the letters and everything? Um, the texture is basically, it's random. It's, it's one inch texture depths and everything. One inch strokes, one inch strokes at different depths based on those one inch strokes. I don't have a one inch stroke in between these letters. So it's doing the start. It's randomizing it and everything, um, but it's not uh, creating that depth. If I wanted to, I could come into my uh, texture tool path here and I could reduce my cutting length. You know, if I reduce my cutting length, let's say we cut it in half here, it's going to completely randomize what this sign looked like. But we may be able to get some more depth in there. Um, and it's going to take a moment to calculate that one. But uh, the, uh, the um, really in those tight areas, the bit doesn't have room to get its stroke in, you know, that one inch stroke to create that random pattern. So it's just, it's just barely kissing in there. So if we were to uh, reset the preview, which I'm going to have to reset the preview. Uh, and if we were to um, just preview that visible toolpath, just the texture right now without all the other letters. Well, actually that's dumb. Let's not do that. Why, why would I do that? Why would you do that, Lenny? Uh, let's go in here and let's select all of this and preview it again. <clears throat> yeah, Dave, Dave asked the question of the day. Dave's like, hey, what's the runtime on that texture toolpath? <laughs> Especially if, I, if my lines are half an inch long, that's a lot of up and down, up and down, up and down with that router and everything. Um, and uh, yes, okay. Um, bear with me a second. Debbie's got a great question uh, coming up here. Uh, could you add a texture from a clip art, from a clip art or the clip art? But yes, you can actually create a texture pattern from the vectors of a clip art. So if we <clears throat> look at there, here's our V cut coming in, uh, doing our V cut and everything, and then uh, follow that with our texturing toolpath. We'll be able to see with those shorter lines, it's, it's a lot more stubby, you know, that ball nose bit and everything. You can see how it's a lot more uh, stubby and everything, but we get a little bit more depth and variation in between the letters because we have, we have, we can get those strokes. So we have a lot more depth and variation. And in some areas that's not going to carve because it's got to stay an eighth of an inch away from my selected vectors. And there's just not an eighth of an inch in there. So we get very little, you know, uh, texturing and all, but now even with that, you know, it's just completely uh, different looking. If we let's, let's, let's reverse it. Let's, let's change it up a bit and let's make our cut length. Let's go five inch cut length, right? With a variation of, uh, you know, one and five, eight, one and seven eighths and everything. Now on the eggs, I didn't want any texture carving in the eggs. I wanted it kind of be like a sign, like the eggs are raised off of a little sign board of its own, you know? So that's why I don't have any texture in that area. Uh, I just think it, uh, you know, it looks better. Now let's reset this preview one last time and let's preview this one last time with a longer texture and we'll see what we get. Let's reset our preview and preview the visible tool pass. And now this is a longer stroke uh, with the um, ball nose bit texture. And again, if I change the angle, and have it instead of carving across, have it carving at an angle. 
I could get a better angle in between some of those letters, right? My bit can go at an angle a little better than it can straight across uh, and, and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways, uh, Tennessee, to change the depth uh, in between the letters and objects, not just the letters, but in between the objects and things and stuff. All right, so the V-bit cutting in and everything. Now our texture has got a five inch cut length and so with that five inch cut length, it doesn't look as good, right? Because it's five inches. It's not getting any variation and we still have to stay away an eighth of an inch from our object and all. Well, that five inch, it can't get the full five inch stroke in there. And so it's staying, you know, it's, it's picking up, you know, further away. So now we have all this bare open spot. So for me, for me, the one inch cut length kind of gave me the best uh, look and everything. And I could even reduce, you know, I'm using a 16th inch bit. I could you reduce the how far away it stays from the objects and get some more texture in there. But I like staying away about an eighth of an inch. It's kind of a safe number for me and everything. And all that wonderful stuff. All right, let's last the last time. I keep saying last time, but let's um, preview this sign in its final form. And then we'll go in and answer Debbie's question, uh, which is, can you add a texture from a clip art or from the clip art? Um, yes. So she's referring to in our clip art gallery, and also another version of clip art. I'll show you two ways, but let this finish calculating out or carving out. Okay. Our V bits coming in now and our no, our 16th inch and mills coming in and getting into those little area, clearing out those pocket areas where it can fit, uh, followed by the V bit. And then follow that up with the final texture. All right, now something has changed. I'm, I'm going to stop it right there. Something's changed with my texture toolpath. And let's see what it is. The angle's changed, so I don't want a one degree angle. Uh, my cut length, I never changed that back. So I typed in the one inch in the angle instead of in here. So uh, I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the cut length, I wanted to change that back to one inch. I didn't want to put in a one, eight, one degree angle. So uh, we'll recalculate that. And I should be able to just preview the texture over this. It's going to look a little, a little funky, but that way you guys aren't sitting there watching me. And after it uh, calculates this, before we carve the final carving, um, before we carve the final carving, let me answer Debbie's uh, question. So Debbie was saying, hey, in our clip art, can we use some of the texture files in there? Can we drag and drop them in uh, to our uh, folder? And yet the answer is yes, you can. And Debbie, I don't have any texture files available for me uh, in, in this particular VCAR Pro. They're all in my Aspire. Um, so I don't have any to show to drag and drop, but yes, we could put in a 3d texture in there. Now, another way of doing a texture, I kind of, uh, call it a grunge is if I come in to, uh, bear with me a second. Let me find it. Um, bum, 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 bum. All 
where is that going to go? Downloads. Uh, I could import an image. Import an image. Uh, let's go to my downloads of a, let's put this over here. Move over there, George. Of a wood grain texture or some kind of texture vector, right? And I could trace that. Bear with me a second. Let me get that image. Stop. My mouse is acting up on me. <laughs> Come on, mouse. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's preview, apply, close, turn off that image. So I could take a texture uh, such as this and, you know, I could uh, throw it on my board, size it appropriately, scale it down a bit. Find the best part of what looks the best that doesn't look too disastrously crazy. And then what I would do is I would have to select all my vectors and trim around those. I would have to create my offsets and stuff and, and trim around those because this is a 2D vector. And what I mean by that is, let's say my border here. I don't want the texture going right up to the border. So I would offset that inward by my eighth of an inch. Okay. And then I could take my object, select my border, and I could use my trim tool and clear everything outside of the boundary. And that will remove everything from outside. And then I could get rid of my offset. And now that vector is an eighth of an inch away from my border. I would have to do that with my text, take my object, you know, that's over my text or whatever, my lines, anything that's kind of touching that, uh, you know, and everything. Basically, I'd have to select everything and clear. I could use my trim tool. So if I have these objects selected here, if I group them together and I come in and select my text, I could clear clear everything inside the boundary, the text being the boundary, and it would get rid of that. But I wouldn't want it again. I wouldn't want those lines coming up to my uh, letters. So I would have to create an offset. So long story short, we could do things like that. We can bring in vectors and all we can, you know, trim, uh, you know, them around and stuff. Now that's different, uh, Debbie. That's bringing in a piece of clip art uh, image and tracing it your clip art textures are 3d textures and when you drop them in it's a 3d model and these objects would be on top of that 3d model and stuff the thing of it is i don't know how they would look um because i honestly don't know i'd have to i don't have any tileable textures or anything like that to 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 try that out to show um, so we'd have to kind of, you know, experiment and play around with that. But you could. You could draw your own vectors. You can create a texture out of anything, any kind of vector. Hell, if I wanted a texture of a bunch of chickens, I could just multiply them multiple times and create a texture pattern <laughs> and everything um, and all. So, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, so what we've got here, let's go ahead and um, turn off our texture toolpath here. Oh, we got a, sorry, we're, uh, I, uh, we were going back and, um, uh, doing this final preview cut. And then 
while that is previewing, guys, last question. Start is 924. I'd like to end before 10 o'clock tonight. So start asking those questions. And yes, Tim. All right, guys and girls, I never do this and I should start doing this more often. But hey, if it's your first time joining us here at uh, Spindle TV, uh, definitely come in and uh, if you like this video, click those thumbs up because uh, it helps with the videos, you know, uh, algorithms and things. Uh, but also subscribe. Think of subscribing to Spindle TV. We'd love to have you. Uh, if you know anybody else that's interested in kind of designing stuff and all, have them subscribe to us. You know, re recommend us. Uh, we'd love that. And I never do that. I never promote myself enough. And and Tim just threw it out there. Hey, don't forget to hit that thumbs up, people. So thank you for that, Tim. I appreciate that very much because uh, I never, I, I always forget uh, to tell people to do that. But uh, yeah, I would appreciate that much so. All right. So let that texture come in. And again, we could change the angle of our texture. We could change, you know, uh, all kinds of things to get different dramatic looks and stuff. But uh, that is uh, what we end up with. And just some cool designs. Now, if any one you are, in, if any of you are interested in everything, I have Adobe uh, Illustrator, right? And so with Adobe, um, I have uh, what's called a vintage pack uh, that was purchased of all kinds of vectors and things. And uh, using those pages of vectors and all, um, you know, there's thousands of them. I can pick different types of little elements. Uh, you can go online uh, to uh, places uh, like, um, oh my goodness, my mind is drawing a blank, uh, threeaxis.co or, uh, you know, uh, freevector.com and things like that. And you can find all kinds of different little patterns. You can Google things and stuff. Uh, and, and, and you can um, get them. I utilize the uh, little elements that I have handy, but also if you've got a creative style to you, you can also draw, draw your shapes and everything. Uh, I mean, I always approach things as shapes. Basically, uh, we've got, right? We've got two rectangles right here that have been skewed in node editing to create these little curves, right? We've got a long rectangle here. We've got circles, a uh, little bit of an offset to a circle, and then they're kind of closed off to create this swirl, or a rectangle with an even bigger curve, right? You just look at this as shapes, right? A rectangle turn into a square, node editing to pull it into a point. You could literally draw these very, very easily uh, just by manipulating nodes and, and, and drawing your shapes and stuff. Uh, and you could create your own vectors. We talked about that uh, a week or two ago or last week or what have you, where we talked about, not last week, the week before last, where we could talk about, you know, just getting used to your drawing tools and, you know, creating your shapes. Like this shape here, I drew two arcs, two circles, uh, did a little bit of node editing to create these kind of spearhead uh, points, and boom, you know. The little windmill adds a little decorative element to it. And if we were to kind of preview around, you can see this really nice, simple farm sign. Now, we got to end this with the question that Tim, uh, who was it they asked about the Dave Garbett asked the ultimate question, what is the runtime for the texture? I'm actually going to tell you the runtime for this entire project, and it's not going to be a small one. So don't get shocked, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but uh, we'll start with the texture. Okay, that texturing toolpath alone with that 16th inch ball nose bit all by it lonesome is about two hours and 51 minutes. Okay. All right. The V card part of the sign with the V bit is about 44 minutes for the V card to come and do all the decorative edges and things. Now, these are based off of my machine's rapid rates, uh, my machine, my tools settings and everything, my feed rate and plunge rate and all of that stuff. So my speeds are a little conservative and everything. You, if you've got a bigger machine, you can race these out and really reduce your time. But if we were to look at this project in its entirety, my three end mill cuts, my quarter inch, eighth and 16th inch clearing cuts, my V carve cut and my texture. If we were to look at this, this project 
22 inches long by 11 and a quarter inches wide with that texture and everything would be about five hours and 51 minutes is what it would run me based on my machine's rapid rate, my machine's scale factor, basically what, you know, uh, my machine running, how long it takes to actually carve. It's a 1.3 scale factor, but also my plunge rates, feed rates, step overs, all of that stuff and everything. So about five hours, 51 minutes based on the digital wood carver settings and everything. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, remember in the original design, remember if we, uh, the, our original design, which was simply this and this, if we've reset, oh man. Well, the regular V carve sign, the very simple V carve sign, that one was a carve time of about 46 minutes. The profile cut with the V bit was doing a two minute cut and the V carve toolpath was about 44 minutes. So about 46 minutes to just do a regular V carve on this. And uh, without the texture, the sign carved like this, Ray sign minus the texture, you're about a three hour run. Okay. All right. So with that, I will zoom this to create a nice little preview image. And that's about a $150 job all day long. <laughs> yes. It's a, it's a, it's, it's not a cheap sign. You know, if I was doing the cheap sign, it'd be a simple V-carve. The simple V-carve one, if I was doing it in the craft fairs and all that, uh, this would be a little bit more expensive uh, sign for sure. All right. So, Ronnie, uh, uh, 166 and everything, uh, Carl, Carl, all you guys, I appreciate all the kudos and everything that you're throwing out there. Um, you know, uh, Dave and, um, and everybody. So as always, I appreciate those kudos uh, that everybody's popping up in the chat. Again, if you did like it, man, uh, thumbs up and share. You know, click that thumbs up button and share. I'd love to see those. And I am actually going to make this file available. So this file right here uh, minus all of these toolpaths. Bear with me a second. Let me turn these, select this, this. Uh, let me delete these tool bags. Uh, this file here with all the tool paths and everything, the file will be available. All the little vectors that I used, everything that as it is, as well as the individual vectors before they were sliced and diced and put together. Uh, they'll all be in that uh, layer. It'll be a layer that's uh, the uh, side ornament layer here. Um, but that file will be up in the video description uh, in just a little bit. As soon as class ends, I'll start cleaning this up, naming the layers all nice and pretty for you. And then I'll make that available. So if anybody wants to make a sign like this, they got some farm fresh chickens and eggs. They got, uh, you know, and the two fonts that I did use, uh, both of them, uh, I think the Cooper black is a default font, you know, that's on your computer. Uh, the Cooper black, uh, if not, I'm sure you could find it on uh, dafont.com. I'm a big fan of D-A-F-O-N-T.com, dafont.com, and Saddlebag. And Saddlebag was off of dafont.com as well. All right, so those two fonts there and um, and everything. So that was the two fonts that I used uh, to create this. But I will make this file available for you guys and girls. Um, and... And that's it. Now, before I say good night, I do want to show you one thing uh, for those that have subscribed uh, for training and all that stuff. Uh, the two projects, uh, your two project downloads and everything, uh, they'll be available. I'm actually going to email them to you uh, for this month and then the next month you'll be able to grab, but I'm actually going to email them to you. And I just wanted to uh, share with you a model that I created and get your opinion. Uh, let me go into documents here. And I'm going to share an image. So the bum, 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 bum. bear with me. It's hiding. Uh, cross. Oh, there we go. All right. I'm going to bring up two pictures. 
and we'll just get your uh, opinion. Uh, so this is a 3D model cross uh, that I designed and laid out uh, and everything. Uh, and built up and stuff and all that's going to be available. That's going to be one of the projects uh, for you guys and girls that have subscribed and stuff. Uh, and um, that will be one of the projects, uh, this cross here, little decorative cross. It could be added to a shield. It could be added to a blank plaque. It could be added to whatever. It's a 3D model STL file. And uh, the other file uh, is on the Spindle TV website. Uh, but let me see if I can... Pull that up if I go to my documents here and um, equal one. Let's pull that up. It will be this model here. Okay. So that will be the uh, second model. So those are the two models for this month uh, that you get uh, on the two projects and everything. And uh, we'll go from there. Now, let's get out of uh, defund.com, or not defund, but uh, wordmark.it. Remember that. Now, Debbie asked the question, did you decide about subscription rate for the monthly uh, on the one-for-one one help? Yes, I did, Debbie. It's uh, either $10 a month uh, for an hour a month, or it's $110 a year for 12 hours uh, for a year. And you get two free projects each month download when you subscribe. And you can go to digitalwoodcarver.com. Uh, right now, uh, you can go to the digitalwoodcarver.com website and you can subscribe if you want uh, some one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, SpindleTV.com is still not ready yet and it's not my fault. It's the SSL certificate waiting for that to come in, waiting for all the validations and everything. They got to make sure that I'm a good guy uh, But uh, before they secure me for $1 million. Um and uh, but for right now, uh, digitalwoodcover.com under inspiration and learning. If you go to the training page of inspiration and learning, and you scroll down to the bottom of the training page, uh, you can subscribe by uh, monthly or annually. You can actually do one on one, you know, by the hour. And one of the things that you do have to uh, be mindful of, or one of the things I want you to know, uh, we Digital Woodcarver is, uh, you know, promoting us and everything and everything, but they play no part in the arrangement between you and I. When you subscribe, you're subscribing to me doing business with Spindle TV and a simple design of Ocala. Uh, and uh, there's Digital Woodcarver is no party in the agreement. Um, there's no cash payments and everything is handled through Stripe and PayPal. So you can either pay with PayPal or through credit card or debit card with Stripe. Um, but uh, currently right now, the Digital Woodcarver uh, page uh, for signing up is secure. So you can actually go there. SpindleTV.com is not ready yet uh, for going there and getting, uh, you know, signing up in the subscriptions. Please do not sign up on Spindle TV. And I'm saying this to you now. Because if you see this here, it is not secured yet. So I do not want anybody entering in their information in Spindle TV yet. But very soon, uh, when the SSL certificate gets put in and everything, uh, it'll be highly secured. And you guys can, you know, shop all day long. Uh, those models are, you know, you're going to have uh, projects uh, each month for the people that subscribe, but also the models that I create will be available for sale and for digital download and stuff too. Just not yet. Be patient with me. It was supposed to be last week, but the SSL certificate guys and girls are, um, it's taken a little longer than I expected and everything, but pretty soon spindletv.com will be up and you'll be able to get all kinds of files and stuff and things and all that. Okay. All right. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, it's 938. I don't think I missed any questions. I don't think I missed any questions. And if I did, I apologize. And I'll go back and I'll put, if I missed any of your questions and stuff, I will put them in the comment section. I'll answer them in the comment section down below. All right. All right, all right, all right. Okay, everybody, until next time, thanks for joining me. Have a great night. See you soon.